Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining the Virtual Foundry in our webinar presentation today, all about microwave sintering. Um, my name is Tricia Cease. I'm the president of the Virtual Foundry, uh, and I'll introduce you to your other hosts in just a minute. But first, I need to let you know that today is Tuesday, October 11th, 2022. The time is 11.03 a.m. and the temperature is a very nice 62 degrees Fahrenheit here in Southern Wisconsin. That's 17 degrees Celsius for you, Celsius users. We are experiencing a very lovely fall, an extra warm day today, um, but it's just a beautiful time of year in Southern Wisconsin. Let's get right to the good stuff and the microwave centering webinar. Our agenda today, I will give you some um, information up front. We'll tell you who your other hosts are, introduce you to them. We're going to talk about FFF metal basics. So what is this style of metal 3D printing all about? What's that current process that we're using now? And then we'll introduce microwave sintering. It's still in development in the experimental phase, but we'll walk you through what's happened so far and show you some of the possibilities with that. We'll tell you what equipment and supplies you need, and you'll also get to see a demonstration of the process and the results that have been achieved so far. We'll have time for Q&A, and then I'll leave you with some info and resources, links, to supplies and tools and links to everything that you need from the virtual phone. So with me today, as always, is Brad Woods, founder and CEO of the Virtual Foundry, the inventor of filament metal 3D printing filaments. He handles everything about science at the Virtual Foundry. Say hello, Brad. Hi, everybody. Uh, you've met me already, founder and president of the Virtual Foundry. I handle everything that happens to do with the business itself. Um, and then with us today is Highball. He's an engineer, a tinkerer. He bills himself as a guy in a shop, but we think of him as so much more. He's been doing some really cool work with filament and this microwave centering process. Say hello, Highball. Hey, nice to see you all. So today's webinar is being recorded. So don't worry if you miss anything. It'll be posted to YouTube um, after the webinar is concluded. It might be a few days, but you will get an email with the link to the YouTube video. So don't worry if you miss anything. Um, type your questions in the, in the chat box. So we will have time for Q&A at the end, but sometimes we can answer your questions as they come up as we go through. Um, so let's get started. FFF Metal Basics. The Virtual Foundry produces FFF metal, glass, and ceramic 3D printing filaments. So what that means is, like you see on that picture on the left, it's filament, it's 3D printing filament on a spool. And we start with regular 3D printing plastic and load it with so much metal that you can then remove the plastic, fuse those metal particles together and get a full metal part at the end. So you're going through the print, debind, and center process. So it's a pretty familiar three-step process in metal 3D printing. Now the current debind and center process, when we're talking about microwave centering, the printing part will be all the same. There's no change to that. And we really won't be talking about that part at all today. The, the difference is going to be in the debind and center process. So the um, normal, I guess I'll call it process today, is that you've got a crucible for the debind portion of the of the process. You'll bury your print in a refractory ballast that supports the part shape, and it also aids in the in that um, binder material leaving the print. That's in a crucible, you'll place it in a kiln, uh, a regular kiln, uh, you'll, your kiln needs to have a programmable um, controller. And it also needs to be able to hold the sintering temperature of the material you're working with for several hours. That crucible will go in the kiln, you'll run the debind time and temperature profile. Once that is complete, for some materials, you will repack your print in new refractory ballasts in a crucible. 
You'll add sintering carbon and the job of that material is to prevent oxygen from reaching your part during sintering. You'll place that crucible back in the same kiln and run the sinter time and temperature profile. So that's what's happening right now. It's a process that's working really well for people. Um, and what we're going to introduce today is an alternative to that current debind and center process. Now, before we move on to that, we're gonna talk about aluminum and titanium a little bit. Those are popular materials, but they're also a little bit different because they are reactive. So Brad, I'll ask you to talk through how these two are different from the rest of the metal materials that we offer. Right, so these are materials, they're not found in nature as metallics. They're always bound up with oxygen or something like that, um, which is part of why they're expensive. Uh, it takes a lot of processing energy to separate that, uh, that oxygen molecule from the aluminum, uh, titanium, and there's a couple others. Um, but because of that, its natural state is to be in an oxide. So aluminum will do just about anything to pick up oxygen. I mean, it will take it away from something else. It, it's a very, very powerful uh, chemical reaction that's difficult to deal with. Great. So you need a specialized environment for those two materials. Um, are there cheap and safe gases to flood a kiln with to manage these two? Not for these two, you're gonna really need some special situations for these if you're talking about a regular kiln. With the other materials, bronze, copper, and the steels, you can flood the kiln with argon to manage oxygen if that's your choice. We offer sintering carbon so you don't need to use gases. Um, but now as we move on to microwave sintering, you may be surprised that Highball, who's joining us today, has had some success with aluminum. So let's talk about microwave sintering. It's really important to note that it's in this experimental phase. I appreciate all of you so much for telling me what you hoped to learn out of this webinar today. And a lot of you said you wanted the, to know the process. And I have to tell you that we don't have a set and ready process to give you today. Microwave sintering is still in development. So we expect to be able to give you a process in the future, but we thought it was important to let you know about the possibilities here so that you can possibly experiment yourself if you would like to. So it's important to remember everything that we're telling you is very new. So let's talk about the basic process and how it's the same and highball. I'll bring you in and ask you to talk about your experience. Uh, yeah, so uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so with microwave centering and again, emphasis on on the new um, started doing this about a month ago and uh, in just like the world of software rapid iteration is uh, is kind of the name of the game right now um, so that's why we can't give a hundred percent process but I, I think I can touch on the basics of how I've been able to get um, some degree of success I focus primarily on aluminum um, because it is a challenging material. If I can get it working with aluminum, it really should translate to any other material. Um, this is used by some home uh, hobbyist uh, glass makers. And that's sort of where I was uh, uh, the muse rung <laughs> a little bit. Um, the, the kiln itself is, uh, as you can see in the, the graphic there, um, it's some sort of alumina-based kiln. Uh, and the black uh, layer on the inside of that, uh, that picture is silicon carbide. So what the, the whole principle of this uh, kind of relies around is the silicon carbide acting as a heat collector uh, inside of the microwave. Uh, and that's gonna translate those to direct heat and uh, that's going to center your part. And I've been experimenting with a full debind and center process in the microwave as well. Um, but what you'll notice in a, uh, in a microwave, you don't really have, uh, you can't set your internal temperature of your, your silicon carbide crucible. <laughs> you have low, medium, and high. 
and you have how long uh, how long you want to zap it. So, uh, but to relate this back to the traditional process, you have a crucible, you have a heating source, you have your part, and you have ballast, which supports your part. So in that regard, it's really almost identical. It's just a slightly different heating mechanism. Uh, and it's a lot quicker. Um, so uh, with with that, Trisha, I don't know, how, where do you want me to, <laughs> where do you want me to go? Uh, oh, you're doing great. Yep. So you talked about how it's the same. You're still loading a crucible, adding the ballast, running a debind cycle. You're um, applying some oxygen management, running the sintering cycle. Um, now, let's talk about how it's different. And the question came up, which is a great lead into this. How quick is a lot quicker? So let's talk about <laughs> that difference first. Yeah. So um, now the setup that I'm using, and I've expanded uh, since then, but I haven't uh, tried those out, is a basic uh, 600 watt microwave. So just so that you can kind of see, uh, it's just a basic microwave. Uh, 60 or 70 dollars from from amazon so that that setup is uh takes takes place um of the kiln which i also have sitting next to me but how quick is quick uh on a high setting um for about uh 15 minutes i was able to go from an ambient temperature of 70 degrees to about roughly about a thousand degrees fahrenheit so uh, that's pretty fast, and uh, certainly my electric kiln can't ramp that high. Uh, what I'm noticing is uh, ramp rates depending on your, your setting. Uh, so on a low setting, you have certain things that are similar to kilns on, the, on your controller. Uh, you, you have a, a maximum ramp rate that you can achieve uh, your maximum peak temperature, and that peak is dependent on how many uh, heat collector, how much heat collector you have in a, in a crucible. So um, one thing I noticed is that on the low setting of the 600 watt microwave with a single element, um, and I'll touch on the, what I mean by element in a second, uh, it can reach uh, about 200 degrees Fahrenheit uh, with a ramp rate of about six uh, Fahrenheit per minute. So that doesn't seem like a lot, but for the debind cycle, that's actually pretty useful because you know that you have a peak of 200, that's your upper bounds, and you know that you can get to that peak, uh, depending on your ambient, fairly quickly. The medium low setting can go up to about 400 degrees. So to put this in perspective, a standard debind cycle with the virtual foundry filament runs to about 400 degrees Fahrenheit over about two hours. Um, and it holds, it holds for a given amount of time. And then you ramp that up to about 800 degrees Fahrenheit and you hold for two to three hours as well. So you don't want to exceed that. You want to go low and slow so that you burn out all of your, uh, your binder. And then you want to be able to ramp up to your center temperatures. So being able to fine tune your, uh, your max temperatures and understanding your ramp rates has been sort of what I've been trying to do and at least with the 600 watt microwave, have a pretty good estimate on how that works with the setup I have. Um, higher temperature metals, you need something a little, you know, I've, I've about maxed out the, that particular microwave at around 800, 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. And that was achieved, you know, over about a 20 to 30 minute microwave cycle. So it's hot enough to, you know, certainly do bronze um, and, you know, probably copper if, you know, given some time, but aluminum, it's definitely within the range. And uh, I have a 900 watt microwave and a 1100 watt, uh, 1100 watt microwave, which should achieve much higher temperatures into the steels and other, uh, other materials. So. Hi, Ball. One big question is why doesn't this whole operation blow up? You're putting metal uh, in a microwave and we've been taught from birth not never to never do that. Yeah, the, the dangerous thing is just the arcs. And that comes from, you know, metal objects with really, really sharp points. And uh, when an arc happens, 
uh, you're really running the risk of damaging the microwave. But a microwave is actually, you know, the internals are metal. <laughs> so, you know, metal is already in the microwave. Um, but the one, the one thing that protects this this part and these pieces are the non uh, conduct. I don't know if conductive is the right word, but a an insulating barrier, which would be the crucible and the the ballast. Which when you uh, when I have the crucible, I always make sure to put a lid on top, and you know, that looks something like this. Um, this is one of the versions, which I if you can see that. Uh, it's a relatively small box and it's ra uh, rather crude looking, but you don't need uh, anything fancy to really get this working. It has a, a lid, which is uh, seals down on, on top and uh, ballast goes into uh, this, don't want any dumping out, but ballast goes into there and your parts surrounded by that, which insulates it. So you, you, you really, the biggest risk really, in my opinion, is, uh, you know, proper ventilation. Um, I've been doing this for a little bit now, and there hasn't really been any, any signs of concern. The outside of the kiln is not the thing heating up. It's the internal heat collector, which as long as you have uh, thick enough walls and ballast uh, to support that, you know, ambient temperature is anywhere from about 150 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit on the outside of the crucible. So it's very manageable. Let's talk about the heat collectors specifically, because part of what makes this interesting is you're not heating up the crucible. The crucible itself is invisible to the microwaves. They pass right, right. through it, and they don't heat until they hit that silicon carbide heating element. So that's partly mm -hmm. why you can hit these high temperatures. It's very, very concentrated. You're heating up a relatively small amount of mass. Small amount of mass uh, rather quickly. And you know that, that heat doesn't escape. I mean, uh, given enough time, the outside of the crucible does heat up to a, to a point where you don't want to touch it with bare hands, but that can really be affected with um, how thick your, your crucible's uh, walls are and how much packing of ballast you have to dissipate that heat. So as Brad said, the elements themselves or collectors themselves are, if you think about it, it's a, a heat, heating source that you can move, move anywhere that you want. Um, and that's where the heat will be collected at. And you know, that sort of spawned a, uh, the other idea of, um, you know, my first iteration had the, uh, as you can see in the picture that you have, Tricia, the, the silicon carbide is sort of painted around the sides and that's, uh, you know, hardened in place. And so that's where your heat's going to be given in a, in a <coughs> circular area. But this is, uh, it's a standard coaster mold, but um, the coaster had an inset in it. And I printed a silicon carbide element, uh, also virtual foundry filament, and put a layer of refractory. So it's sealed totally in this. And it's a modular, uh, this is a modular heat, uh, heat collector. So um, one thing I've been experimenting is what can I get uh, with the placement uh, you know, can I can I improve the process with placing this directly where I want? And um, it's so far it's looking promising that yes, I, I can. <laughs> um, so what this is is a modular heat uh, heating element. Uh, that, that that's what I was talking about, and it's in uh, inside the middle. Um, if you can see about the middle is a silicon carbide element which I printed roughly in a kind of like what you'd see on like a grill. It, it's nothing fancy. You could put print it in any kind of shape. Or if you just had a silicon carbide powder, you could inlay, inlay that in. And uh, a refractory, uh, a cast for refractory layer was uh, casted on top of this because the, this is just a standard, you know, coaster mold. So uh, it was filled. And now if I put this in the microwave, this is the heat source and it's insulated. Um, so you don't have to worry about the, uh, silicon carbide, uh, crumbling out of your, uh, your crucible or getting, cause there's, when it's just layered on the outside, like, like you saw in the, in, uh, in my previous example, I have it inlaid into the crucible when it's exposed to the open air there after a certain amount of cycles, it can get crumbly and fall out. And, you know, you can replace that, but these are a whole lot easier to replace and it controls the uh, level of heat that I have. 
and the um, I can direct the heat direct exactly where I want it to. So during debind, I'm using a single single element, and during center, I uh, put a second element uh, to make a column of heat to direct uh, direct it exactly where I want it on my part. Now, um, somebody, Mark just mentioned like microwave meals of pizzas and pies, and Mark is absolutely right. In fact, yep. an excellent analogy for how these crucibles or microwave kilns, as they're called, work is like a hot pocket. So you've got the cardboard sleeve, it's lined with um, silicon carbide, that silver stuff, and then it's concentrating the heat right into that hot pocket. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it's a pretty, it's a, it's a, it sounds like a fancy thing, but it's, uh, you know, the principles behind it is they're pretty straightforward. Once you kind of realize that it's a heat source, the microwave is not doing the heating, it's doing it kind of indirectly, but it's passing through your crucible and you can put it in whatever shape you want, whether it's a kiln coaster or a, a hot pocket sleeve. <laughs> So yes, now Steve just asked uh, is if we can call this the hot pocket method. And I think that's amazing. Uh, we probably we couldn't get around the copyright. <laughs> yeah, the trademarks might be, uh, maybe <laughs> maybe if we come up with a, a nuclear pocket or something like that, it's not quite the same. Maybe we now, the same with it. <laughs> sticking with the crucible slash microwave kiln topic, you can see in the photos here, that same photo that we saw on the last slide, that's a commercially sold microwave kiln that you can buy on Amazon. You go to amazon.com, search for the words microwave kiln. You'll see this exact um, unit. In fact, that's where I got the picture. The one on the right is one that Highball made himself and he does have um, videos on his YouTube channel about actually making these. Yeah, and that was the V, you know, first iteration of it um, and the, the cool thing about it, I think, is actually being able to inlay, to use the surface of the kiln as, um, you know, where you embed the elements. I still think that's a cool concept. It's just that it did have some issues with the crumbling nature. Um, but a side effect of seeing this is that silicon carbide, you know, uh, gets quite hot. And um, I've noticed some areas in that version where the silicon carbide has certainly fused together in itself uh, and is quite hard, uh, which is another something that I'm putting in the back pocket because uh, uh, being able to, you know, center silicon carbide is an interesting uh, prospect. So, right. As a quick sidebar, we made this material not for this application, but it was made for abrasive applications or maybe some semiconductor heating element type applications, but not microwave. Uh, Highball uh, innovated, called an audible, and took our silicon carbide 3D printing filament and 3D printed microwave heating elements, which is really cool. Okay, Highball, let's talk about how you figured out the temperatures and the power to use. So folks in the chat are, are talking about um, duty cycle versus variable power. How are you knowing what temperatures you're getting? You can't be sure the maximum, uh, where the maximum of the electromagnetic fields are. So talk through um, your experience with figuring all of that out. Yeah, and, and to the degree of accuracy that I have um, for, for this um, is a infrared gun. You know, what I'm doing is measuring uh, what I can observe um, at the, the scale of my eyes uh, and, uh, and the strength of my hands and hammer. So um, with the uh, degree of the ramp rates, the, that's been just sort of meticulous measurements um, throughout areas of the kiln uh, with the element by itself um, at various power levels and uh, just observations. So uh, that's why we can't really probably publish, you know, the full process with it, you know, guaranteed success yet, but uh, they're generalized observations with some degree of, uh, uh, some degree of accuracy, but not to the degree that, you know, would be commercially feasible at this moment. But uh, there's surprising a, a lot of things that you can do with rough estimations. Um, that, uh, you know, 
it, aluminum just about a month ago was sort of like off the table for me, at least um, for a lot, probably a lot of people, at least centering since the only current process is that I'm aware of for additive is, you know, a, a laser centering. Um, I'm not certain that there's any other filament based method for doing that. Um, and you have to center in, you know, probably a hydrogen reducing atmosphere, which is also unattainable for, uh, you know, somebody in, in the shop. <laughs> uh, so you go, go ahead, sorry. Uh, what are the advantages of this microwave strategy is time. So when you're centering in a kiln, the, the cycles are long, you know, they're in, in terms of hours. So yeah. you're, keeping, you're keeping the reactive metals or materials like the aluminum at temperature for hours. In this case, you're cutting it down to minutes. There's just less time for the oxidation to take place. Yeah, the whole center cycle for some of the pieces that I've done, and again, they're rough, but it's metal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the whole time it takes for center from ambient, you know, room temperature is about 30 to 40 minutes in a 600 watt microwave. And that's not a lot of time, but you end up getting up to the proper temperatures, again, measured at the scale that I can, uh, I can observe. And it doesn't go past the point of melting because we have maintained shape. So I know that to some degree we're getting even, uh, even heating with the proper element placement. Um, and it's enough in a rough sense to produce the, the metal part, but certainly more needs to be done. Uh, you know, We could potentially look into putting probes inside the crucibles and actually getting real measurements uh, with various points uh, would, would probably involve uh, you know, drilling some holes in the microwave. Um, and Brad, you had mentioned you know, some potential doing on that too. So more, more experiments need to be done and more measurements need to take, but eventually we should, we could, we should be able to come up with a, a pretty good benchmark for a microwave. So if you can benchmark your hardware and know that it'll work in that environment, then it should be uh, reproducible. Um, Highball, you described a calibration technique uh, where you sort of put your microwave on low and then just ran it to see what the maximum temperature it would hit. I thought this was a pretty interesting strategy because you could calibrate different microwaves using the same solution. Yeah, and it's it's not much different than like the, the old cones that they use in ceramic uh, you know, firing. They've been using those for well before we had you know, fancy equipment to measure. And just by knowing where the cone slumps is, you know, that's that's the the max that you kind of achieved. So this is a similar approach to that, just finding out what that rate is and benchmarking it to your hardware to the different temperature settings uh, seems to be working well enough, uh, at least well enough for me to continue. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you to just describe your specific process, but first we need to point out that in that commercially available microwave kiln, there you can see there's a hole in the bottom and that hole does need to be plugged. Yeah, uh, that um, and the commercially available one is meant to be rotated this way where the, the non-laced uh, silicon carbide part is actually the base. But uh, with that, if you plug the hole with some either a refractory or a piece of shelving, uh, kiln shelving, something like that, fire brick. You can, you can actually carve fire brick pretty easily with just a, you know, with just a file. So that could be plugged into that. If you flip it upside down, then that uh, the top would actually, you know, hold your ballast pretty well. And the, the bottom would actually turn into the, to your lid. So with that commercially available part for about probably $40, I think if maybe cheaper on Amazon, you can you could achieve a, a about the same setup that I have. I just wanted to make it because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, walk us through um, your process. So um, my process starts out with a just a green part. I've been using these uh, masks as benchmarks for me because they're fairly intricate, fairly small, they're thin, and uh, I can print a lot of them without wasting too many. Um, too much filament. Now, uh, I would think that this is a relatively challenging part to produce. So if I, the thought was that if I can, you know, consistently get good results on a relatively challenging part, 
than a, a thicker part or a you know part with less intricate geometry should be no problem. Um, sorry for the train noise, but that's what happens when you live next to a train track. So uh, then uh, I just pull this part off just like I normally would with a uh, the regular process. Uh, what are you using for support material? Oh yeah, so support material, I have a uh, dual extruder. This is just PLA. Um, so PLA stick bonds very well to uh, any of the filament, uh, filament um, products. And I found that it comes off really easily and clean. Uh, so just cheap Amazon PLA. Um, but you can use, there's an interesting thing where you can, if you have a dual extruder, um, you can actually mix materials um, like uh, copper, bronze, or there's no, no limitation on, you know, what you can mix. So for some things, it, it might be useful to mix the different uh, components, but we'll talk about that another day. <laughs> um, so then I have my, uh, my green part, and um, the first a couple of uh, tests that I've done, I did thermally debind in my regular kiln. Um, the uh, because I wanted to, you know, rule out any possibilities of incomplete debinding from a microwave. So, um, but now I'm pretty much just trialing on debinding completely in a microwave because it seems pretty attainable to do. So then I would get my uh, my crucible, which I'll, I'll show this one uh, first because it's the easiest to hold. Uh, but um, I would get my crucible, and this particular uh, type has the uh, elements on the uh, in the walls, so there's no additional step. I would essentially just pack this with ballast, which I uh, this was from a previous you know previous center um, and debind, so there's still some ballast in there. I didn't quite clean it out, but I pack the um, just with enough layer of um, ballast so that the part would be supported, and I would put that into uh, into here and give it a good shake. Um, I'd fill up. Uh, probably about yay much uh, from the bottom so that I could first load the part. And, and then I would. What are you using for ballast material? Uh, just an AL203 blend, um, okay. similar to what you guys have. Just uh, I kind of, again, uh, went rogue and got my own. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, the, the parts inside, and then that would be covered with just another layer of ballast and shaken until it's properly supported um, and ready to go into the kiln, just like, or actually this is the kiln, but it's ready to go into the microwave, uh, just like that. Now, the next steps, sorry, let me get my headphones. The next steps, um, you always wanna make sure that you cover with microwave centering because uh, you don't want any arcs to happen and damage your, damage your microwave. But other than that, this isn't necessarily airtight so it still will allow gases to escape, um, but it's tight enough where uh, it it doesn't prevent any, or it prevents any kind of arcs coming out. And in fact, it is important that it's not airtight because yeah. the, that oxygen is important for the debind process. Correct. So the debind, um, and I was touching a little bit on the ramp rates. Um, after assuming that you've properly benchmarked you know, your, your microwave, then what my process is, is to uh, is calculate just where I want my set points for my D-binds, which would generally be about 400 degrees Fahrenheit and hold for X amount of time. And um, I'd ramp pretty slowly and then go up to about 800 degrees and uh, ramp again at whatever rate that I, I deem would be good at the time. That's, in, that's changing, <laughs> um, but that, that process would take probably a couple hours to make sure that you've totally debound, debound the part. Um, and from that point is when you take it out and you could either let it rest uh, or you could start the center uh, you know, immediately after, but the, the part would be out of the microwave and specifically for aluminum um, is where things deviate a little bit. Um, for the aluminum to, to work, uh, I have used a brazing flux, um, about a teaspoon, uh, really just enough to, and Trisha has links on, you know, the stuff that I'm using here, but this is about $17. It's used 
um, just in brazing. So it's, you know, a common material, but everything I use is something that you can buy from Amazon or a local, you know, hardware or welding store. Um, so I, I use about a teaspoon for the part because I cover it simply just you know, if you can envision how big the part is in the in the crucible, um, I just want to make sure I dust just enough to cover that uh, completely. And, and then you're, you're not putting that directly on the part itself. Not directly on the it part. To the top of your ballast. Correct. It's just sprinkled right on top. It's like a seasoning. This is like a cooking show. So I, we're using microwaves. Uh, we're using casserole dishes, and we're putting seasoning. So. Um, that's, it's about that simple. And uh, then we'd put the, the lid back on uh, and then put it back into the microwave uh, for our center cycle. Now, so a few things that you, oh yeah. Let's just talk for a second about why that doesn't need to be in contact with the part. Because um, we, you know, we talked earlier about aluminum being different. The oxide layer that coats every particle of aluminum has to be broken before those aluminum particles can join together. That's why it's such a special process. Commercial. Yeah, and and aluminum in um, even in like TIG welding, um, there's a the microwave itself might be playing a, a benefit in for allowing the center of aluminum because in TIG welding uh, they use uh, I think they just call it the microwave scrubbing or AC scrubbing where they uh, flip between you know a current and then uh, that rapidly that rapid changing uh um that rapid changing current uh clears off the oxide and allows for a proper uh tig tig weld now flux is also used to to bust that oxide as well because it off gases a favorable uh environment uh probably a blend of you know some hydrogen and other halide material you know gases that uh soak into this crucible and allow for you know for the proper center to happen. So there could be a combo of of the microwave and the flux, or it could just be flux. Um, I've tried flux in a standard kiln, but the cycle, the 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 time in a regular kiln is too long for um, you know for it not to just oxide you know oxidize. So you know you there's a chance that if you had a properly vacuum sealed thing with you know some you know, the hydrogen, it would, it, it would work just fine. It's just with this, the rapid rate of temperature increase, I think is um, allowing for the aluminum center to, to occur. And well. we, we also talked about aluminum um, being reactive. So in the presence of flame, at least, and oxygen, it will explode. Why isn't it, why isn't that happening in the process that you're doing here? Uh, Brad, you had got well, any? That, well, <laughs> right. We didn't rehearse that answer, I guess. Right. No, I put some thought into this. I don't think you could get it to burn in the microwave if you were to try. So, yeah. like, if you take aluminum powder and throw it in an open flame, it combusts violently. But in this situation, it doesn't have access to very much oxygen. And I think I'll actually try and experiment to see if I can get it to ignite. And I don't oh, think well, it's going to be that simple. Do that yeah. on the weekends. I'll use I'll use your microwave, Trisha. Okay. <laughs> I, I I also think that just the insulation of the you know the ballast and the uh, you know I've been doing it. I haven't seen any explosions, so um, just right. using my eyes here. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to explode. If okay. it does, the part's kind of small, and uh, you know, worst thing is I throw the microwave out in the backyard and let it. <laughs> <laughs> let it let it do its thing but not, nothing <clears throat> the biggest thing i think is the uh the ventilation aspect um i think that's the biggest risk that you just have and and that's the same with any sort of debind and center process or or lost lost resin or lost uh wax method you you're going to have some gas that you don't want to breathe in so you want to make sure that you have a, a ventilation system but the benefit of you know a microwave you can pick this up and put it in your backyard if you want to with an extension cord. So uh, you can't really do that with a tabletop kiln, not easily anyway. So there's some benefits there safety-wise. Now you're, you're talking about how quick it is. And um, in the kiln process, we talk about slow ramps um, up and down the temperature scale to avoid your part cracking. 
and you're doing this pretty quickly. So have you seen some cracking in your experience um, from the escaping glass, uh, escaping gases during the debind or from, from the part heating and cooling very quickly? What are you seeing there? The, the debind I think is the most critical at with the slow rates because you could, I, I imagine there's some level of boiling of the, um, you know, of the binder, which can mess up the structure. But assuming that the, you know, the debind is done low and slow and all of that, that binder has kind of been burnt off, then I haven't seen any noticeable problems with ramping it up as quick as I can up to temp for center. And I, I'm not sure that it's, you know, you know, certainly necessary to do, uh, but again, I haven't, I haven't seen any, any noticeable problems by doing that. The, the biggest problems I've seen are just kind of, uh, you know, not quite fully debound parts um, causing issues. I have seen where I've exceeded the temperature a little bit where some areas have sagged uh, because they got a little too close to the sun and melted. Um, but other than that, uh, no. <laughs> so you are microwaving, you're running the microwave for five to 40 minutes at a time. And we've talked about how um, you're stopping the microwave intermittently to let yeah, that, the microwave. That, yeah, that's microwave. Yeah, the thing that I'm worried about would be the microwave overheating. And um, that's, um, you know, your microwave's built of plastic and metal components. So there's certain thresholds that you don't want to exceed. And honestly, what I found with the smaller kiln is that it does allow more heat to radiate out, which is a little bit more than I feel comfortable doing like a steel. Because if you do a 30 minute time, you know, even if the, if the kiln isn't heating up, it's the elements on the inside that does radiate out. Um, so the thicker walls and more supporting ballast helps dissipate that. Um, and what I do in between certain longer uh, microwave cycles is I have a, just a portable fan, which I will put in front of the microwave to cool that down quicker while the, um, while the, you know, the kiln itself sits sealed um, just outside of the microwave. So any kind of time where you want it to hold at a temperature, um, you know, it only loses temperature at a certain rate. And if it's sealed up, it, it holds that temperature pretty well. So it can sit outside of the kiln without being bombarded by mi microwaves for a while uh, while maintaining a certain temp. So I've noticed that, you know, that's, that's been working at least for aluminum. And for the other materials, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but I'm, I've made a bigger, much bigger kiln. Um, so that's actually in here. And it, it takes up the, um, Let's see. Can you, it takes up almost the entire uh, volume of my desktop kiln, uh, but it just fits inside of the microwave. So um, that's going to be uh, my probably moving forward kiln um, with the modular heating elements, because if I want to increase the heat or uh, direct heat at a certain, um, you know, a certain area, then that's gonna allow me to do it and take up the entire volume of the microwave for parts. Now, are you using the microwave's turntable? Um, I did at first, but the little plastic piece melted, so not anymore. <laughs> um, I was uh, toying with the idea of printing a replacement out of uh, Pyrex and then putting that on there, but I haven't noticed any downside of not spinning it. Uh, certainly with the bigger crucible, I, I wouldn't really trust that. <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. spin on that on a $60 microwave, I'd be worried those wheels wouldn't be working too well. So no, I do not use the turntable um, anymore. And now looking at the slide here, it talks about the sintering process, bearing and ballast, adding sintering carbon, because that's our normal kiln setup, cover and load it in the microwave. And then we talk about sintering carbon hasn't been tested yet. Highball's only been working with aluminum, so he's been using that flux. So the sintering carbon as a part of this process hasn't been tested yet. You might be able to use specific fluxes for the different materials, for example, steel flux, um, if you're working with steel in this process. So that's unknown at this point. Yeah, it's, it's unknown. Um, I mean, but at, at some point it, you know, what I think that the difference would be that you just wouldn't need as much sintering carbon because uh, it's, it's a shorter cycle 
So you probably only need a small amount of carbon and you, you may even get away with just mixing it inside of the ballast, um, you know, as an additive to that. So it, that needs some testing, but like Trisha pointed out, the flux may be enough if you get like a steel flux, if you're trying to do stainless, uh, you know, similar to instead of an aluminum, aluminum brazing, it'd be a steel. And I have a couple of different ones, which I'll be trialing out here. Steel's on the agenda. I'm just, I was waiting to build out a bigger, um, a bigger kiln and to use the um, beefier microwaves for, for stainless and, and above. Okay, let's take a look at the results. Yeah, so in that picture, um, it's, it came straight out of the microwave like that. Again, this is a test piece. Um, you know, I've since smacked it with a hammer a couple times and I, I got it to break along a, uh, you know, along the line but it's uh, since oxidized on the outside a little bit. So just all it takes is a little polishing. I used a rotary tool in that picture just for about a couple minutes. And generally, if you have a, a poor center of a part, um, the rotary tool would eat into it or sandpaper would eat into it or a hammer would fracture it into a million pieces. Uh, that wasn't the case with this one. This was the first um, true success that I saw. It is solid. Solid metal, drop something of it. But the solid, solid metal, uh, I can't speak to the porosity of it because again, I'm observing with you know what I see and can kind of feel. So, you know, what I'm really trying to do is nail down the process with the same part over and over again. And if I can nail down that process, then I think that's at that point where we need to start, you know, actually dissecting the thing, checking it under a microscope, uh, you know, doing any uh, some tensile strength analysis. Um, and at that point, that's when we can kind of begin doing that. But it is metal, it polishes aluminum, and it's hard to the touch. So, um, uh, Highball, you, uh, are you sharing this on social media? Like, are you keeping up on Reddit or anything like that or someplace that we can follow? I'll, I'll, post, I'll post it on Reddit, um, on YouTube. I, I try not to spam people too much. Um, so generally, if I have an update, I'll put it on my YouTube um, community post or but if I get something that's, you know, what I consider at least a milestone or worthwhile to, to share that, then I'll put, you know, I'll either put out a video for it and share it to the, to the Reddit um, and probably send you guys in a, in an email personally and say, Hey, look at this, <laughs> did something, did something cool. Um, so yeah, there's, there's progress updates. I mean, what I think last night I shared um, a community of my debind and center cycle that had updated uh, but that's going to change rapidly. So, um, yeah. Okay, let's take a look at these questions. How do you control the temperature? Again, uh, the control is um, with that benchmarking process uh, and understanding how an element in itself heats up at the given settings. You only have your what's available to you on the microwave, um, which is power level and the time. So you have really two factors that you control. And, and one other is the amount of, you know, your heat, your heating element surface and your heating element material, which in this case is silicon carbide. So just measurements and um, a lot of them and to understand, you know, just trying to benchmark that so that you can get as close to a real model in your, um, as, as possible to the, to the actual model. And how can you control the input power of the microwave to control the ramp? The input power, like the power of the microwave uh, itself, or just the the setting. I mean, you only have again, you only have <laughs> on the microwave itself. You only have the you know low to low to high generally, but the input power of the microwave in this case, like or at least the microwave's power output is six hundred watts. So that was controlled by just buying a six hundred watt microwave. Okay. And right. and the, and and buying a 900 watt microwave, and then also getting a, an 1100 watt microwave. So. <laughs> well, normally, a normal with microwave. I mean, it's either on or off. If it's six, yeah, it's, watts, it's on or off. Watts. But if you want it to run at half uh, half intensity, it'll just turn. It'll only run at a duty cycle of 50. percent Yeah. Yeah. Now, are you? Are you, are you able to repeat the process? Is this, has this been repeatable for you? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've gotten multiple of these, you know, um, these masks to some degree of success. And these are all like, this is 
this is metal. I mean, I have like, prob but I'm using the same part. So I, you know, I want to reproduce the same part and I want to reproduce it in a as close to perfect state as possible. So I have like seven or eight of those masks just like floating around in various, <laughs> various states. And, uh, you know, I've got it to the point where I can get it metal. It's just, how, how do I make sure that I, I get a perfect part at the end? And the debinding, um, debinding in the microwave is the challenge right now that I'm trying to go for. And that's what's causing the, the various states of good because you know something didn't quite debind properly so in some areas it would bubble up and you know the, the piece would fall, fall off but i'm getting closer to reproducing it um in a perfect state but yes reproducible to the to its metal okay <laughs> so i'd like to talk a little bit about the debind part of it so it has to be done slowly i mean it's pla it, if you heat it too quickly it simply boils and yeah. destroys the shape of the part so most of our users uh, problems with the geometry of a part actually start at the debind phase. Mm -hmm. Done slowly, uh, done slowly, it doesn't boil, it it will sublimate. It comes off and, uh, and becomes a gas, but you have to go slow. Yeah, and that's the challenging part. Um, so just finding out where that point is and you can't exactly, you can't see into it because, you know, it's an opaque box. So just proper measurements. And then, you know, I'll probably mimic the, the debind cycle that I currently do um, in the microwave. And I'm assuming that'll probably lead to the best results. It's just, haven't done that yet uh, before the webinar, but you'll see it, see the results soon enough. <laughs> so speaking of you, you, the process that you're using now, you're going to share that with us. We will uh, on our website, create a blog that includes uh, that information, a link to this webinar as well. So we'll round out some of that information on our website. Now, could you actually paint the part with silicon carbide to to attract that heat? There is, um, I mean, you probably could. The problem is that um, the debind when you debind a part because you don't want to paint it whenever it's uh, still a green part because you're going to have shrinkage and you're going to have this you know loose form. So you you you'd want to probably do that. Um, uh, after that debind has occurred, but that's where I think maybe it's not as important to get it directly on the part, but to get near net shape, um, where, you know, I used a, uh, a, a coaster for my shape. And I also, uh, you print it in a sort of rectangular shape, but there's nothing stopping you from, you know, changing that to a cylinder or, uh, having a very uh, strange or interesting uh, heating uh, design so that it directly fits your part. You can always you can always produce uh, an element to fit your part if you were doing the same sort of parts over and over and over again. Um, I'm doing you know it could be any part, so I need a more generalized approach. But um, you can certainly make a specialized uh, heat collector. Yeah, on this topic, I, I see a lot of potential here. And since the uh, silicon carbide is 3D printable, I think mm -hmm. you can actually come to a point where we you know, embed heating uh, collectors in parts, like for ceramics or glass or something like that. Yeah, and or you could print a shell that's just bigger than your part in the yeah. same shape. And that then you center, if you can center the silicon carbide, which it's looking like that's a potential, yeah. then you could center a shell um, in your parts shape, but big enough to contain it so that it, you're getting heating directly where you want it. Yeah. Okay. Um, could you use silicon carbide as a ballast? It would get really hot. Mm, that, that's a <laughs> and, it, and it might fuse together. I'd be, um, you know, it, depending on it, it it's a lot. Um, Somebody can try it. <laughs> it's, it's, an, it's an interesting idea. You can actually blend it into the AL203 so it isn't, yeah. you know, at 100%. So we have right. lots, lots of interesting experiments to do that. Could certainly try blending. That would be, you know, that would be, and it, you know, I probably have some blended in some of my, you know, because, because it falls, it, it was falling out into the ballast. So right. uh, it is possible to blend. 
So let's talk about that for a second. You're using silicon carbide filament, which is made just like all of our other filament materials. It's got powdered silicon carbide held together with that plastic PLA like binder. So mm -hmm. as you are using it in embedded into your microwave kiln, into your crucible, it's debinding, but yeah. then it's staying embedded in there as essentially placed powder. Yeah, when I made the mold, um, I made the, um, I had a, uh, a inset core where I uh, adhes, uh, uh, I used a spray adhesive uh, on the PLA core where I put the elements and I poured the uh, refractory around it. So the refractory hardened around it, but there was a hollow core, PLA core, which then I turned it upside down, packed it with ballast and did a burnout of the PLA in my kiln. So when the burnout of the PLA happened, what was left was the, you know, the crucible with the, the silicon carbide elements embedded and a layer of ballast supporting, supporting that. And then what I did to harden it up is put that entirely from my, my regular kiln into the microwave for about 30 minutes uh, to harden up the elements. And then I was able to ex excavate the ballast out, and I was, and the uh, the elements were embedded into the walls with some degree of hardness. Um, so yeah, it that that whole process was all powered by three D printing because the mold itself was just a PLA mold. Is your pyrometer monochromatic or bichromatic? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I have the same one, and I don't know either. Yeah. I just knew I, but the thing that was important to me was just the, um, you know, the, the max, I wanted to get an approximation for, so that I don't stick my hands into the microwave and burn them. So that was, that was the, uh, the onus of, you know, using that and, you know, I'd have to do some more research on the, the model that I have, but I think Trisha, you linked the one that I have. So, you know, it's in, it's in the slide deck. Um, so the next question, can you debind in the microwave or just center? And we have talked about that already. You've started doing your debinding in the microwave. Mm -hmm. Plausible. <laughs> for, for, um, for watching the temperatures inside the microwave kiln, could you use a disposable passive temperature indicator? I, I think if, as long as it doesn't, you know, collect... I, I think so. Um, I, again, I, I'm using what I had, uh, what I have available, but um, I think there's uh, definitely opportunity to increase the visibility of the, the ramp rates and the temperatures on the inside. I, I think that's critical for understanding how this works um, going forward um, to actually tune the process to you know, something very repeatable. So that's uh, something that I think we need to do some research on. And, you know, again, this has only been, I've only been doing this for about a month. So, you know, over time you, you build out your, your tooling and uh, I think we're, we can get to that point. So you have talked about the equipment that you use and since you can't click on a link in a video, what you see here is the source of the tool um, the exact name of it in that source. And then also if it's on Amazon, this ASIN number so that you can find that specific item. Um, some of the things are from the virtual foundry, the heat resistant gloves, the silicon carbide filament. Um, other than that, as Highball said, he's getting everything. Uh, he's using things that are really easily available. Yeah, the, the, I think the barrier to entry with this is a lot lower. Um, I mean, I've got three microwaves and the filament and a 3D printer are, you know, most people have a microwave. You probably don't want to use the one that you cook stuff in, but the microwave, you know, was about 60 or $70 on, on the, on Amazon, the safety equipment's affordable, the, you know, so as far as uh, uh, a way to at least experiment and get this. I think it's a very approachable um, method where, I mean, I have a kiln, but that is probably mm -hmm. out of reach for some people. Um, so that's why trying to get the debind stage in the microwave and the center stage using a single tooling, I think is important for 
for people. Right. And this has been the objective of the virtual foundry is to make metal, uh, metal 3D printing accessible to as many people as possible. And moving to something so simple like this is incredibly interesting. The, the other approaches out there, I'm, you know, I'm not an additive manufacturing uh, student or work in the industry. I, I'm a programmer. I, you know, <laughs> this, uh, this um, without Virtual Foundry, I don't, this would not be something that I could even attain um, or, or do. So I think there's something to be said about that. Yes, thank you for saying that. We, it is a strong focus of the Virtual Foundry to um, democratize metal part manufacturing. Uh, our, the very first podcast that Brad and I recorded talks about democratization. Um, so that's been important and is something that was on Brad's mind when he invented the product. So <clears throat> important to us and it's just, it's awesome to see it being put into use in the world in these various ways. Hi, Paul, I do have one more very important question for you before we wrap up the webinar today. Well, I think I know where this is going. <laughs> Go for it. What, what did the corn stalk say when the farmer asked if she could tell it a joke? I got nothing. I'm all ears. Oh, wow. That's. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Highball, for sharing your experience about microwave centering. It is a super exciting topic and really fun to be a part of it. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Again, the video will be posted on YouTube. So if you didn't get all your notes written down, don't worry, you'll be able to watch it um, again and again and again. So thank you everyone. And until next time, happy printing. Thank you, everybody. What's up, Austin? I'm going to unmute you. You're unmuted. You did it. Yeah, I, I have that power. Because <laughs> I'm blind. I don't know why I'm trying to do this without my glasses on. <laughs> I need to do a little bit of maintenance. So talk amongst yourselves for a moment.